Hello, and welcome to the SMU Video Archive Series. In this series, we interview members of the SMU community who can provide insight into the history of SMU, and especially from the perspective of their time at the university. I'm Travis Jordan, and today we have Mary Alice Gordon, Dr. Mary Alice Gordon. Welcome, Mary Alice, to this series. Well, I'm delighted to be here, Travis. I think the way I would like to begin would be to get you to tell us how you got to be here at SMU. What, uh, what brought you to SMU and, and when did this happen? In 1958, I moved to Dallas from New York City and I had done some part-time teaching up there when I, after my daughter was born. So when I moved down here, I came to SMU to the psychology department to see if they might need to have substitute teachers and I was informed by Virginia Chancy that no, they didn't have anything like that. If the professor couldn't come, they didn't have the class, and so I thought, well, that's that. And she also informed me that they would not hire a master's person, that you had to have a PhD. Well, after that, I had an opportunity to obtain my PhD from Texas Christian University through a grant from the American Association of University Women. And I was teaching two years at the University of Texas at Arlington. After I earned my PhD, I was going to the Southwestern Psychological Association. So on the way on the plane, I was sitting there going over what I was going to talk about. And my husband, Randy, was sitting next to the aisle and Dr. Jack Strange from the psychology department at SMU was sitting next to him. So he was telling Jack about my dissertation research. And so Dr. Strange came to hear my presentation. And he was hiring four people that year to be in the psychology department at SMU. So he asked me whether I'd be interested in coming to SMU. Well, this was my first thought when I came to Dallas. And then, it's a very prestigious school, and I was very excited, and I, of course, said yes. So I was hired an assistant professor in the psychology department, with part-time teaching the Nature of Man course, which that's when I met you in 1968, right. 68. it was, 1968 that we met. So that was 10 years after I came to Dallas, and we were both teaching Nature of Man. Well, it was good for you, and it was certainly good for SMU that you found your way here to, to SMU. I, I know, because we've known each other for many years. And uh, even though we did start off teaching together in, in the Nature of Man course, um, why don't you tell us basically why that course existed and, and what its uh, structure was? And, and uh, so let, let's talk about the Nature of Man course because I think that's a good place to begin. Well, this was a unique course. And I don't know who put it all together, but when I came, they had started it. And Dr. Paul Haynes from the Economics Department was the person who was in charge of it. And the design was to give the students an opportunity to read, to study, to have various experiences where they would learn about philosophy, psychology, economics, biology, religion, anthropology, the art forms, and really so on. interdisciplinary. It was interdisciplinary. And they had people from all over the university, from different departments, teaching in the course. And that's how we happened to meet each other. And you were right across for hall, the oh. hall from where I was. <laughs> the higher hall was being remodeled at that point, so I was at the top of Dallas Hall. Crowded into the old, unremodeled Dallas Hall. Yeah. At that time. In fact, I had a sort of funny experience. One night, I couldn't get out. I was locked in. Most times, you worry about locking something so people can't get in. So I called up Jack Strange, and I said, Jack, I'm locked in my office. And he said, oh, I'll be right down <laughs> to let me out. But the thing that was really delightful about the course, we did meet once a week to discuss the reading material. And we had an opportunity to share ideas, how to present the material. I think, as you know, none of us were experts in all the areas. So we would have people who from, were from economics or anthropology to talk about some of these. And I know for me personally, I really grew a lot. I learned a lot. For example, the religions of man, reading Houston's religions of man exposed the students and also me to more information and some of them have never read about other religions. But let's talk a bit about that course content because I think in the history and the perspective, and I'm not sure that anything exists like that now, do you remember some of the things that were the course content? You mentioned in, in the religious area there was that, that book uh, by Houston on the religions of man. Mm -hmm. But what were some other things that we talked about uh, in content? Uh, well, we were studying economics, and also one of the things that interested me in one book, they were saying that it used to be in the United States, 
people would rush out when the monthly newspaper came to see what was happening in the world. And then, at the present time, at that time, and I think it's even that way now, that we don't think that things are happening in the world. We realize that sometimes there are other powers that are causing things to happen. And we don't yeah. think about that. Yeah. So people maybe are more disillusioned and are looking for heroes sometimes. Yeah. Well, I remember it was, it was a different course every, every year, too, because uh, the, the faculty would choose different material. And so it was a course in process, mm -hmm. uh, which reminds me that the teaching method, it seemed to be, me was more focused on uh, or as much focused on process as on content and and uh, do you recall some ways as a psychologist it must have been interesting to you to figure out some ways to uh, engage the students in, in the learning process so. that was very exciting for me because the idea of just standing up and talking telling things to the students I believe that it's important for the student to interact for them to talk about what they're reading and what they're doing and so I tried very hard to give people an opportunity to do that. For example, when we were reading something on child psychology, I would invite neighbors' children to come to visit the class. And so then the students would get a chance to interact and talk with the students. And I know one time this one little boy was playing ball with this older student, and the little boy said to him, do you know what it's like to play ball with a grown-up? And the student said, no. And the little boy said, I don't either. <laughs> and the student was really <laughs> sort of like, so. he said, students are all, kids are always doing that to me. But some of them had not had an opportunity to interact with children. And also, I tried to make sure that we'd go various places, like go down to the art museum here at mm -hmm. SMU for people to see it. We had some wonderful pictures there. Not just talk about art. Not just talk about it, but go to see it. And we went to movies. I know one movie that we went to see was Clockwork Orange, which just really had quite an impact on me and I think other people to think, particularly since it was dealing with conditioning, which is something that in psychology they did spend a lot of thing, time doing that. In fact, we brought movies to the classes oftentimes too because oh, yes. that, it was kind of an experiential emphasis in the learning process, not only going places but observing life and the movies was a good way to observe. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and the idea that I think was to have people talk about what they were experiencing and what they were thinking about and to get into discussions on it. Mm -hmm. And one way that I tried to encourage that was I then had people do projects that they would then report on the projects. And you all didn't always know what was going to come out of it and the subjects that we talked about and just having people think about different ideas like one time when we were studying, reading an article about a tribe and their ideas about death. Well, this was something that, of course, students, people now don't like to talk about death. It's something we look away from. And one of the students was saying she thought it was just horrible how people would go to the families, homes, and so on. And I was trying to communicate that it's very important that people let you know they care. They can't change what has happened, but that they care and they're concerned about it. So that was. Did you find that the students generally did participate in the discussion and, and did come into the interactive process of the course? And yes, most of them. Maybe not always all the time. Of course, there are some students who do talk a lot, but then sometimes you get on the subject and somebody who'd been rather quiet would all of a sudden, this was something that was of interest to them. And I built into the grade for the course that they, need, they needed to have some participation. So that was good. I know one time this one student was in a superior studies class and she was trying to find how she could get her A and she kept saying, well, what do I need to do and so on? And I finally said to her, I have a feeling if I told you that you had to stand in the corner on your head every class for 30 minutes that you'd do it. And she looked at me and said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're probably true. Yeah, but, but it was really. But the idea of it, and one of the things I thought was really good was an experiment that they had later on. They started having the living and learning floor, and they had three classes, and I was fortunate enough to ask to the uh, teacher in one of the classes. And they had all of the men living on one floor in a dorm, and all of the women in the classes living on a floor in a woman's dorm. And then there were three classes, and they took their English classes and their Nature Man class together. So I would see the Nature Man students, and we'd meet in the lobby of one of the dorms or someplace else, so that made it a lot freer to do that. And the idea was to help the students get to know each other, not just dating, 
but just almost in a family situation. So they would form their groups and, and interact, and if things were going on that weren't good in the living situation, those things would come out sometimes. They could actually uh, experience and act on and practice some of the things that hopefully they were learning in the mm -hmm. class. Mm -hmm. you no, know, I think you said that, or you told me that you uh, started out your career teaching half of it was in the nature of man, two courses and two courses were in psychology. Um, how did you, how did that work out? Because uh, teaching a psychology course must have been somewhat different from teaching the nature of man course. Yes, but I also tried to do some experimental, experiential things in the psychology department. Well, it meant that I had to, like, as you said, each, each semester, each year, and by the way, the Nature Man class, as you recall, was two semesters. That's so we covered those. And I was on the book committee for a couple of years and got to read varieties of literature. And it was really fascinating because people who have just graduated from graduate school expect the freshmen to be ready to read some of these things that they read and were excited about. And, and they weren't always that interested yes, and many in of us what it was. Not long out of graduate school, and we still had that, that thirst for uh, learning and, and, and the, the freshmen didn't quite, didn't quite mm -hmm. have. Uh, one of the things I wanted to add that it was really interesting how in the different groups, like I had two nature man classes, one sort of right after the other. One was in one building and then I walked to another and I think, oh, well, that went over really well. I'll start, I'd get to a different class and it was a dud, something that I would bring up. Did I, I, did I tell you about not having a class one semester? Uh, I think I mentioned it to you how so, so I had this know. dream before school started in the January. And so I had this dream that I went to the classroom and nobody was there. Well, I'd been asked to teach a superior studies, which was all people with very high SAT scores. And I went to the classroom and there was one student sitting there and I was there. And so then we went to the secretary's office and we were in the right room. And so we decided we'd get together the next time class was supposed to be held. So we met and we were still just this one young woman and me. So we walked out and as we walked past the stairs in Dallas Hall, here was a group of students walking up the stairs and I said, are you looking for a, a professor? And they said, yes, are you looking for a class? <laughs> and what they'd done is they had moved to a different class the semester before and nobody had told, and the teacher had not told the secretary. So the teacher had left SMU. So we were so glad you found to each, find other. each other. Oh yeah, that was good. You were going to say something. I well, I think your that. earlier comment uh, was, was something that surprised, almost shocked me uh, as I started teaching, and that is that classes have personalities not unlike people have personalities. Mm -hmm. And I've never, uh, that's always been the case for, for me. And, uh, did you find that uh, throughout your teaching career? Yes. That, yes. that certain class, and it seems like that personality holds throughout the entire course. Well, it really does, and you have to be able to adapt, but I know they talk about actors and actresses before mm -hmm. they go on there they're nervous and so on. The beginning of each semester it seems so important because you wanted to get the right feel there mm -hmm. for them and to have interact with them. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think is very good at SMU and at least all the psychology courses and I felt very definitely in Nature Man, we encourage the students to come and see the professor. Yes. In fact, you told me earlier that uh, you were one of the professors who would have students in your home. Oh yes. And, and, uh, and yeah. entertain them and invite them to come in. And and I think that uh, undoubtedly plays a role in their learning process. Definitely. And one of the things that happens is they didn't feed students in the door in the cafeteria on Sunday nights, so they were really appreciative of being invited <laughs> by on Sunday, Sunday nights. Night. Yes. And so I know I had this one turkey tetrazzini recipe, and this one student, the beginning of the sophomore year, he came to see me and he said, could you please tell me how to make that turkey tetrazzini? Is it difficult? And I said, no, I think you can do it. You open a can of mushroom soup and so on. That's not often you're going to get students asking professors for recipes. Yeah. I, I, I but then also one of the things that I did was have students write journals. I think you might have done that mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. and have them talk about the things that were really affecting them. They really. Uh, let you enter into your lives and then you needed of course to write back to them to give them feedback and I know the things that they talked about the things that were upsetting to them like this one girl's horse died and she had that was her friend that she'd had since she was 10 years old and she'd been in lots of, a lot of competitions about it and so she wrote about that and people like when I first came here in the late 60s and early 70s there was a lot of experimentation with LSD and some of those things. So that was difficult. 
Yes, so, so drugs are not just a recent phenomenon. No, we, we, we no, experienced some of that early on as well. Yeah. Well, I had one student who was came to talk to me, and he was very upset, I could tell. And he wouldn't talk to me in the office. He wanted to sit at the open window on the third floor of Dallas Hall with his back to the window. And here it was warm weather, and I was thinking, new professor here, and I was thinking, please don't jump. Because, <laughs> I mean, it would be, I could just see that in the newspaper. <laughs> the way to begin <laughs> Yeah. But he came to see me one day, and he was really upset because he'd had an LSD trip the weekend before that was a bad trip. He said his friends had gotten some, and it was black, and he was afraid he'd have another bad trip. And I said, well, my neighbor and I are having a garage sale this weekend. Do you want to come and see the people who come to garage sale? So he came and spent two days sitting there watching the people who came to garage sale. But he didn't have a bad trip. <laughs> Kept an eye on it. Yeah, well, and I think he just needed some place to go. To be, right. Yeah, right. and this is important. So. Wonderful. Yeah. And another thing about Nature of Man, because we expose people to so many areas and subjects, a lot of them heard about things that they had areas they had not learned about or known about. So then they learned about majors and they would take courses in those areas <laughs> that otherwise they might not have done that. Uh, so one of the pluses, I think you're exactly right, was that it opened them at the freshman level to the wide range of opportunities professionally and intellectually that they might not have known. There were some downsides too, though, as I recall. It's, it was difficult for them, uh, the, the pace and yeah. uh, the level of the studies, don't you think? Some of the materials that they had to read were, were more difficult. And I think one of the things that some students saw me later and said they really would like to take the course again as a senior because with the other experiences that they'd learned. I mean, one book that we read was Escape from Freedom by Fromm. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a very important book to expose the students to. I, the thing was the idea that people need to have a reason to live, but also you don't just escape. You don't get married to get away from home and so on. You need to s have freedom to do something, not freedom from. And I think this is something that a lot of people could do well to think in terms of. Am I just trying to get away from something to have freedom from it? Or do I want the freedom to do something with my life, to make choices, make a difference? Do you remember any particular books other than those that, that you thought had an impact on you or students? Uh, or phrase that a little bit differently, because it was an interdisciplinary course, was there any uh, particular discipline that you began to get involved in and learn about uh, that perhaps you hadn't and maybe would not have ever been exposed to? Mm -hmm. Well, quite a few. I mean, into some of the biology, the economics books, I had not taken economics, so I had to learn about those. And anthropology, I found, was very close to psychology in mm -hmm. many ways. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that, to me, psychology just makes sense as far as helps people live. But when I first came to SMU, it was mainly, a lot of it was rap psychology and behavioristic. And so it has changed. We can talk about that a little bit later. But yeah. I know for me, I didn't feel that I should push my discipline. And in fact, I had students who took my course for the whole year or at least half a year before they realized that I was a psychologist because I tried to be fair to all the disciplines that we discussed. And I think often uh, people did that and that was that was um, the reason we had to get together every week and talk to each other so uh, we yes. would know, know how to be help through some of the books or uh, you know, covering things from philosophy to art uh, is, is, is a pretty big undertaking. And I think it was a large undertaking for these students and in retrospect, perhaps they might have learned more in their sophomore year, but it certainly didn't do them any harm in their freshman year. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I think also was good, a benefit for me, is when I walked across campus, I not only saw students, but I knew people who were on the faculty from all over the campus. And I think if you do not, other people have not had that opportunity to do that. So. More than any other time in, in SMU's history, I think it helped to cross-fertilize the faculty and, and, and uh, both personally and uh, professionally, intellectually, keep things mm -hmm. moving. It was a really exciting time. Mm -hmm. This went on for how many years? Ten years? I think so. Maybe it was a little less than that. But one of the things I think that any time you have a course that's a required course, it's sort of like the kiss of death to it because people yeah. say, I have to take that course and so on. So depending, and also depending upon the professor who's doing something, some people just could not get involved in what was going on. Mm -hmm. And they reacted mm -hmm. against that. And it happens that way in other courses, too. It uh, interfered with their own studies and discipline. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. 
Well, it was a, a unique period in our history, and, uh, and I'm glad that you were a part of it. It's, uh, well, that was also like in the late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. We had the group the permit. Of, in the black the students who took over the president's office one day, and I had one student who was in my nature man class, and he came to see me. He said, you know, we weren't going in there to take it over. We were just wanting to ask some questions. So, uh, uh, An apologetic uh, uh, militant. <laughs> <laughs> an yes. apologetic militant. Yeah. But yes, they yes. were. The students were concerned about various things. And well, I know one time I was going to a class, and there was a student I saw outside as I came down the stairs, this was going to a psychology class. It was in the spring, so it was warm. And he said, I think I need to go to the health center and have my, my foot looked at because he'd stepped on some glass and he was bleeding and he didn't have any shoes on. So I was mentioning this to somebody later and they said, you mean you let him come to class without shoes on? And I said, well, I'm interested in what's happening to his mind, not in what he's wearing on his feet. But at that time, I think it really shocked SMU alumni who came here and saw them dressed so casually. And also many of the professors, very casually dressed and so on. It, it was an interesting time. I taught an evening uh, class uh, in the old Eastwood building and I had a student come to school, come to class one night in his underwear, so. Um. Well, I didn't have that happen. <laughs> I'm sort of glad yeah. about that. Yeah. It, was a, it was an interesting time. Yeah. Well, you taught, uh, that was undoubtedly one of the unique experiences of our teaching career, but uh, you taught many courses in psychology, chiefly in uh, organizational and social psychology. Mm -hmm. um, but of course you get to teach introductory and developmental or child psychology and I also taught the psychological testing course too, oh, okay. which I think testing can be very useful if it's used in the right way because for example in the organizations if they can find out who will not succeed on a job I think you're doing the individual a favor just to hire somebody to an, on a job that they will not succeed in is not being kind, so I was interested in that. One of the things that I enjoyed about social psychology is I think it was a way to help people learn about life and interaction. And I know the students would come back and say that they were talking with their friends or this one, one semester I had about five girls from the same sorority and so they were discussing on the way this, well that's why that was happening and they were really bringing that into class about what was going on and I thought that was useful. And one of the things I did was I had a simulated society game that oh, yes, came out about that time, SimSoc. And so that had four groups of areas, a very privileged area, two that were medium, and then one that was deprived. And the only place we could find to have the courses was down in Selectman Hall, and the, down near the God Quad, Yes. down there. And so they had, we had simulated society, we had money and so on, and certain organizations there. But one semester, this group that was deprived, until somebody came to their area who could travel, nobody knew they were there. And so they got really, I heard these voices chanting, help, help, we need help, 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 we need help. So all of the sort of state theology professors were coming out of their offices saying, what's going on here? What's happening? And I told them, I said, <laughs> oh, okay, nobody's hurt, nobody's hurt. Okay. <laughs> Look it was the voice walking. of God. <laughs> we need help. Yeah, so. Well, were you ever um, criticized or censored because of your uh, willingness to use different teaching techniques and, and not that I play was aware games of. in class? Not that, that I was aware of, of. I really wasn't. Did you hear anything about I it? I didn't hear anything about it, but I wondered, yeah. you know, in your own department, did, did, did people say, well, you really shouldn't be doing these kinds of things, or you should be lecturing and not uh, have letting these kids talk to each other so much and that kind of thing? Or well, I think people were aware that people learn in more than one way. And some people learn better by doing something rather than hearing it, so. Did you ever adjust your teaching style in the midst of your class, or I mean in the midst of your course, or, or that kind of thing? Did you ever find a class that just wouldn't go along with you in a certain way? And uh, Did you pretty well be able to bring them along with you? Uh, as you went? Well, I tried to use a variety of teaching techniques. I used lectures, I used the media, and one of the thing I re things that I really appreciated at SMU was when you took over the media department and were sending the films out and getting them there on time so that they were there. And I think you all were very helpful and continue to be in doing that. And so I feel if people can see something, they can get a really good idea of right. what it is. And it starts them talking about things. It, it's something they can react to in a, in a, 
and they all have the same experience to react to in that yeah. way, which is which is helpful, yeah. particularly I think in psychology and social social science. Well, when you meet somebody, you try to find some common ground to talk about. Where are you from, and so on. That's right. So if they were had something happen in class, well, I had one class one day that a student was really um, he wanted to do something. He'd been reading about various things, and he wanted to shock the students and see what would happen. So it was a social psychology class, and so. I, he wanted to come in with a gun and have somebody come in with a gun, and I said, no, they <laughs> just didn't do that. So I told them in the beginning we might have pop quizzes, so I walked in and said they were going to have a pop quiz and to just start writing about something that it was in the assignment, but it was a very complex thing, and I said they'd have 10 minutes. Well, this student <laughs> went over and he said, this is ridiculous. You know you ha you're giving a test in, in organizational. You can't expect me to have studied that when I was studying for the test, and another student was sort of there, and finally I said, well, I think it would be a good idea for you to go out in the hall and I will be out there. So I told the students to go ahead and write about what they were thinking right then and I went out. So we sort of giggled out there and then came back in. But they were just really <laughs> shocked because, but then they had a chance to look at, but you could tell some of the students were so, if they just be quiet then I could think of what I need to write down mm -hmm. here. But uh, that was a learning experience from all of us. And then sometimes things would happen in a class. You didn't know what's going to happen. Like in one of my social psychology classes, uh, near the end of my being here at SMU, it was in 90s, in the late 90s or in there, and one student came in one day and he came in the door and I had an outline. I decided after teaching for a while if they had an outline with space they could write in and I didn't have to spend so much time repeating things for them. And so I sort of would hand it to him if it came in late and I said, would you and he just stood there and leaned against the wall and I said, would you like this? And he said, no. And I looked at him and he was usually a quiet person. He said, I want to read a poem. So he read a poem that he'd written about the girlfriend that he'd had and how he was an alcoholic. And because of this, he started drinking again. He was in AA. So there he was standing there. I had this, it was just before spring break and there they were uh, talking about he was talking about this, but when he read the poem, some of the students started clapping, and then they realized this was not something to clap about. And I had a TA who was very good, and she thought she was really afraid something was going to happen and found out afterwards. And I didn't feel afraid, and I said, well, I think we better go on out of here. And I told her, I told her to have the students write about what their feelings were at that particular point in time. So I went out, and he was really unsteady. And I, my office was on the third floor, so I didn't feel I should take him up on the steps because I thought we might not make it. So he went up in an elevator. Turned out in that class, another student came out, and she had an addiction about food. So she came up to talk. Another wow. young man in the class was in AA. So he came up, and so then I went down to the class and told them what we were doing and, and so on. So then we got in touch with his counselor here at SMU and so later on when he came back to class I asked the students whether they would be willing to have me let him read the notes that they wrote to him and they said yes and when he came back to the class they were so mature they welcomed him back encouraged him to be there and it was really it isn't an experience I want to go through all the time but yeah. it was a real learning but experience for me and for them it's learning about life while living it mm -hmm. which is and they were really important. they were really living it mm -hmm. so that's neat. Do you, do you think, do you see any measurable difference between students' attitudes, ability to learn, uh, and willingness to go along with the teacher between 1968 and 1998? Uh? Well, I think there have always been a variety. I mean, some people would come just ready to party. They did not want to study. Some people came who really wanted to learn. Some people came because it was just the thing to do. Some people who came here were not rich, spoiled children <laughs> of rich families, but they were putting themselves through college, like the one who was a welder when he was not at SMU and would ride up on his bike and then he'd go back to welding and the people that worked with him as a welder were saying, you're going to SMU to college? Not and your was, typical SMU No, student. not the typical, but so many of them were so happy and of the, the opportunity to come here and to have an opportunity to learn. Now this was early on or, or throughout All your career? All throughout, throughout, the throughout the career, your career. There were people who were, were doing it. and. People were annoyed who were going to SMU at the stereotype that other people had about them as SMU students because they knew that it was not typically that Does way. Does this mean that SMU was reaching out to try to uh, have a diverse student body? Oh, definitely, yeah. definitely. And it used to be like you might have one minority student, so later on there were more. And then I think also that they tried very hard to help people who had learning problems 
when I first came here, you did not get people who had problems with have saw and was because they were dyslexic. But then we worked it out that people would take those tests untimed and they would let you know. And so, and the people who had begun to think they were stupid because they could not read and do some of the things other students could do in grade school are now being encouraged and to go ahead and go to college. So mm -hmm. I think, and they are intelligent people. They just have a problem in some areas. And as you say, learning styles are different. And some people, if, if you have a flexibility in teaching, they, they have an ability to learn. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about what it's like to be a woman in this in <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, We still don't have a lot of women professors, but when you came here, you were fairly uh, a rare commodity, I think. Well, when I went to the psychology department, Virginia Chansey was still there. She was there in 1958, and she was still there in 1968. But, so there were two women in the psychology department at SMU, but in some areas they had one woman. Now in the English department and the language department and the history department, particularly in the English and the language, they had a lot of instructors and people who are not on the tenure track to get tenure were not assistant professors. Probably weren't going to get tenure. Yes. And so one of the things that happened about 1970, women got together and the Women's Faculty Caucus, and so we would get together once a month and talk about problems or just get to meet other women and find out what was going on. Some people found people they wanted to do research with. But we invited people from the administration to come and talk to us about, like the provost, and what they had plans. Because I think at that particular time, people didn't think about women as being professional and being career. SMU was very male dominated. They were sympathetic, but I think they didn't like the first provost. Well, it was, was ignorance and, and uh, lack of experience. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as you say, women, it's something to do if they don't have anything else to do at home. So. Now, well, in fact, when I was being interviewed by the chairman of a, the chair of a committee when I was being considered for promotion and tenure at the university asked me, he said that the committee wanted to know whether I was teaching just to get out of the house. <laughs> and. I was really upset by that because I'd always been professional. My father died when I was three and a half and I knew that my mother had, had to support me and a woman needed to be able to support herself and maybe a family. So I was really upset and I, another person, Betty Maynard, who was a single professor, and she said they would, could not ask me that because of course if she didn't work, she didn't get a job, but to ask me that I felt really upset about that. The sad thing about it is they probably didn't, they, they were probably very serious about it. it. Just They figured that that's a real possibility and they wanted to know. Why did I, why did I want to teach? And I love teaching. I enjoyed the interaction with the students. Did the women's symposium come along during your uh, tenure here? Yes. Or was it, already? it had started before I came here at SMU. Did it? I think two years before. And that was something started by Emmy Bain, who was a dean of women at that particular point in time. And she felt that there were so few opportunities for the women students with so many men teachers to realize that there were intelligent, educated, successful women. So this was set up so that women from the community, women from universities, women from other parts of the world would come. And also she included men that people would come and speak and so on. Like mm -hmm. Margaret Mead came one time and that was really the anthropologist. That was really, you saw her when she I was didn't, here? But, uh, I didn't, but. She was really something else. She was about this tall. And she was just just a fountain of knowledge and so on. I suspect a very charismatic person too. Yes, uh, and she was asked at a meeting, a breakfast meeting, whether she would say something about monogamy. And she said, well, American women like it. And this person said, no, no, I mean something in favor of it. And she said, well, there are some women who can only handle one relationship. <laughs> <laughs> she might go get pinned in. Yeah, but it was sort of interesting that uh, that she was saying that. Uh, well, things I think have changed for the better. Uh, there's certainly room for improvement in this in you, but well, I think. Well, uh, back to that, when you were talking about it, having so few women professors, women on the faculty, whenever I was asked to be on a committee, I felt I should be on it because if I wasn't, yeah. well then, you know, there would be no women there. And then I was talking to a person who came later on, who came to SMU in 74, and she said that she noticed after she came here that there were there might be a woman on a committee, but a woman was never the chair of a committee. This person is still at SMU, but she said things have changed. Now women can be chairman of organizations, and we even have some department chairs who are women, mm -hmm. and so on. But, and I don't think people really thought about it, but it was, 
I think women realized it. And also, women were paid less than men were. So. Is that still the case? I don't know, but they had done, there was one time that, a couple of times that I received raises because to equalize my equity. pay or get it a little better mm -hmm. equity for So them. there's been some effort in that direction. Yeah, I think, I think there's been some effort in that direction. Still room to grow, but I think there has been some progress, which mm -hmm. is good. But uh, back to some of the activities that I found, I don't know whether part of it was because I had been around campus and met a lot of other people, but I was elected to the faculty senate body. And so in that situation, that I had an opportunity to meet other people and interact with other people. Mm -hmm. And I know that one of the opportunities I had was to go and listen to the s student senate. We were assigned, Mick McGill, from, Mick McGill from the business school and I were there, and we watched their proceedings, and they were very similar to the proceedings that were happening in the faculty senate. It just sort of moves along slowly, but when you're trying to follow parliamentary procedure, that and, really. And, learning. and also there's a certain amount of copying goes on, I guess, or, or uh, mentoring, and they, they learn what they what they see, monkey yeah. see, monkey do. But it was really, it was really an interesting experience. And well, uh, your career certainly does not seem to have suffered because that you were a woman. But I suspect a lot of that has to do with the individual person, but also the freedom that that SMU did give to to move and to advance and to mm -hmm. to get around. A SMU has always been interested in community development, and you were in the right discipline and I think at the right time to do that and I know because I've known you through the years that you've been active in community affairs and community uh, events. Are there things about that part of your career that stand out that you'd like to share with us? Well one of the things when I first came to SMU after I'd been here about two years I was asked to be the psychological consultant for a Town Lake Awareness Program Town Lake, that's right. Yeah, so Town Lake, and that was back in like 1970. And you still hear about Town Lake. But they're going to turn the Trinity River into a, a lake and it's coming make around it, again. Yes, I know, it keeps coming up. But it was very interesting because community leaders were together and we gave them questionnaires and so on, and I wrote up the report. There was a grant for it. And that gave me, had, I had an opportunity to work with the planning committee of Dallas and also with the Dallas Architectural. Hmm group and that was fascinating because mm -hmm. architects I'd never known any architects before and you know they are put in a very difficult position sometimes they are told by somebody I want this building and it won't fit into the environment so they really are in this mm -hmm. situation of I know aesthetically this is not good and how do you handle you this and working with people yeah. yes and them. they were interested in having the good things in the architect that was here architecture in Dallas to be saved and so on so that was good experience and then I taught some continuing education courses and some in, had like a getting to understand oneself better, sensitivity. And these are largely talented people then who would uh, come for non-credit courses but, but it was a way for them to interact with the faculty. And, mm -hmm. and you teach and they still have the continuing right. education courses so mm -hmm. that was fascinating to do that. You, and, and you uh, were members of several uh, professional organizations in the city, too, I think. Yes. Uh, well, my first experience after meeting Virginia Chancy at SMU was to go to the Dallas Psychological Association. And there, Doc Strange was the president one year, and I was his secretary before I joined SMU. So we, I had known him before mm -hmm. when that mm -hmm. happened. But I was a, it turned out I was the first woman who became president of the Dallas Psychological Association. <laughs> And I did not realize I was the first woman until later when the person who was going to be the second woman president called up to say she was going to be the second one. I said, oh, really? So that was rather mm. interesting. I had not realized that. But I think it is important. But when I first went to those meetings, I couldn't believe how these people were squabbling about various things. And I was thinking, boy, if the people who go to them for therapy would see them now, they would just really think, I'm going to this person to help me. But of course, in any discipline, you have some people who are just outstanding and some people who are narrow-minded and so on. But I think it was, it's a very important organization and for people to have an opportunity to go there. Because if people are in private practice, they don't have an opportunity to interact with other people. And now in Texas, they have continuing education is an important part of what's happening. So you have to get so many credits a year to stay certified and licensed. 
Does the psychology department at SMU uh, command some respect from this organization and, and others around uh, as being uh, a, a good place? Uh? Well, I think so. One of the things like Southwest Med School has had our students who've gone there and other places, and I've had excellent feedback about the psychological preparation that our students had from the psychology department. People who went to graduate schools at other places, they would come back and say they were so much better prepared for graduate school when they got there than some other people who were saying, oh, this is just impossible. And for them, it was not. And I think they always felt that they could go and talk to the professors and that we were very willing to help them. We tried to give them an opportunity to do research, worked with them to do that. So that was Has important. the department grown in numbers uh, in yes. the last 30 years? When I came, there were about eight people there. There were two women and six men. And now they have about 14 people. Oh, and they have two women. <laughs> two women. <laughs> they have two or three women. They've had two or three women all through yeah. the time, but they vary. But it became more humanistic oriented and interested in working more with people. It's too expensive to keep those rats up. Yeah. Before we get too far away from yeah. Dallas Psychological Association, I wanted to show to you this award that I got for the Distinguished Psychologist. It was in 1986 this was awarded to me mm -hmm. for being an outstanding educator and professional and psychologist. This is 1986. 1986. So I was very honored when yes, I received I should, this I because so. I thought that was because I had spent time there. And another organization I worked with was the Dallas Fort Worth Organizational Psychology Group because I'm an organizational psychologist. And so then I received a award from them, which is I guess we should be concerned <laughs> right, about the, time, the, the, the you time know, if you're being efficient with your things, but that's an organization which has people who are concerned with it. This is Dallas and Fort Worth. Dallas and Fort Worth, and people travel quite a ways to come to well, work on that. And then I think you got a teaching award too, didn't you? Oh, I, well, the M Award, that was not a teaching award. That was activities from that and a little, this is what it looks like at, at present. The uh, that's quite M a prestigious award, award on our campus yeah. as far as I was I so surprised yes. when I got this. I don't know how they choose people, but this was back in in 70, 76 that I got that. Fair, and then when you get that award, you get your picture in the rotunda. Uh -huh. So this is a different me, a younger me. <laughs> oh, yes. Right here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, you haven't changed all that much. Different hairdo. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the, that's the side of the times. Isn't it? The, the, the yeah, a there. little different from that. But. Uh. Mm -hmm. One of the things about, I think I should go back and say a little bit more about the faculty, Women's Faculty Caucus, because I think a lot of people did not know about it. Okay. It's going on. And the way it was structured was like three women faculty would be in charge of coordinating the meetings and arranging for them. And it varied across the, the campus. So there'd be people from the art school with people from the H&S and so on. And I know one person, what we did is, was invite all of the new women faculty to come. And I know one person was saying that she would always invite the people to come. And some of them thought, well, that's not necessary. They come from Northeastern universities and come to SMU. And they didn't think it would be different. She said, and some of those people did not get tenure because they thought, you know, they were too many. Um, and it just didn't work out the way they thought it would. It was a shock to them. But so there's a difference, you think, between Southern uh, Midwestern universities in the Northeast uh, in the well, way uh, I think women, are, from women are accepted. Uh, yeah, but I think, so, I think SMU has come a long ways yeah. on this. I really think they have. Well, that was the purpose of the, uh, of the caucus, though, don't you think, was to help change that. And so it sounds to me like they made some really good progress yes. in that. And it was a place for, it uh, sounds to me like it was a place for support and uh, oh, mutual yes. concerns. And when you are such a minority uh, that you feel like uh, you have some worth, and it would uh, help you to do the things that you've obviously been able yeah. to do. And be encouraged to do them, and so on. And also, it's fun to get together. Women oh, can sure. be very interesting to talk with, and so yes. on. So <laughs> just like, I mean, we have a chance to interact with men and various other committees, but it was an interesting thing to do and talk about. Um, have you seen any major changes in the psychology discipline over the last 30 years? Well, as I said, uh, at one point, 
There was a lot about stimulus response, a lot of behavioristic psychologists. And in fact, one psychologist who was hired at the same time I was, he didn't feel that I was teaching psychology. The only thing that was really psychology was rat psychology, and, and he's no longer, he was no longer here after a few years. But I had students who'd come in and they would be so upset because they wanted to learn how to improve their interaction with people, and they didn't really care what happened to those rats, which, which alley they ran down and so on. But I think, you know, that now it's broader, but now we don't have a rat lab at, the, yeah. at SMU. So for some people who would like that kind, you know, that's too bad that they don't have that. Because I had a student about four years ago who was interested in going into animal learning. She wanted to be a veterinarian, mm -hmm. and then she wanted to do work in animal learning. And she is presently almost finished with her veterinarian degree now. So that's exciting to, that she's going to be doing that. She wants to work with wolves. And she has a dog that's part dog and part wolf, so. Don't mind. That's an interesting. That interview. reminds me of another question that I wanted to ask in the few minutes we have left. Uh, are there particular faculty or students that had a, an impact on you that, that you remember for whatever reason that, you know, that, that we might talk about? Sometimes that's important, I think, in learning about an institution and about the person in the institution. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the faculty were, in general, very supportive. And the students, I mean, there was a lot from them. But then there are certain ones that you do get to know better. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the other day, I just received a phone call from a student who decided she wanted to go into organizational psychology as a freshman. And I sort of mentor, mentor, mentored her along the way. And she had problems with written tests, problems with the GRE. So she went ahead, she did internships in organizational psychology firms here. She's gone ahead and she has just been accepted at University of Colorado for a master's degree in organizational psych. And she was very pleased with that. And I think she'll do very well. But she'd stopped by and interviewed there, and they said, well, you just don't stand a chance. And she said, well, this has been my goal, and I've been working towards it. I've done these various things. And she received a call from the woman and said, I think you need an opportunity to do it. And I said, doesn't that make you feel good, oh, that is your, nice. yeah. your skills? And then there are other people that keep in touch with you. And it's interesting, the ones that do, sometimes mm -hmm. ones that you didn't expect to mm -hmm. have happen, but who keep coming in. And then one of the things in organizational psych, I tried to let them know about interaction and or diagnosing organizations if you're in an organization and things are just going terribly what can you do about it you're not just helpless sometimes and also that sometimes you need to leave that organization mm -hmm. and that you shouldn't expect to be at one organization all the time you need to take your skills learn what you can do and then leave and I've had people come back and say when you were first talking about some of those things I didn't believe it but when I got out there that's the way it was so I had this course that was sort of an in-between business and psychology, but it was fascinating. That reminds me of another area that, uh, well, melding uh, intellect and, and business. Uh, you were on a committee that helped to reform the SMU personnel department, I think. I was on a task force task that looked it over, and they made some changes yeah. there. And I think we now have an excellent, I think they call it human resources. Yes, it has a new name now, human uh, resources. Uh, but uh, that must have been an interesting experience for you oh, it to, was. To, to do it because I found out in doing some interviewing that there were some people who were very unhappy about some of the things that were going on at that point and they said can I come see you someplace else and talk about this and also I did consulting in organizational organizations outside and have spoken in various organizations so I did quite a bit of work with Southwest Oregon Bank which was for donors and did some research in that area and this is a very important area that people realize they need to donate organs of their loved ones if something happens unexpectedly. So other people can, can have a life. So now you're retired. Yes. These things are kind of memories, but they're fun memories. But what do you do for fun? What do I do for fun? What are you doing now? Well, I'm thoroughly enjoying life. I guess you can tell that. Yes. Well, my first husband had died while I was still teaching at SMU, and I really appreciated the support I received from the department. He had cancer, and so for three years it was very difficult. Mm -hmm. And I did appreciate the support that all of you gave me at that time. But it was sort of interesting, after I retired, I was introduced to somebody from California, Nevada City, who was single at the time, and I met him through a mutual friend. She told him, you need to call Mary Alice. So we started talking, then we emailed. 
you know people used to write love letters years ago <laughs> and yeah. you know email can do that so I would get up before I go to work out at the Y and write to him in California when he got up he'd go down and see what he got so and when I mail. got back <laughs> so we had mail you had mail and so we were married in 98 and he moved to Dallas he was never going to live here because it was too hot in the summer and too cold in the winter but he came here to Dallas and we're living in Richardson now and thoroughly enjoying being here in Dallas and, and staying busy and very definitely busy he said maybe we should each get a job so we can have some free time but that worked out well but I really feel very good about my opportunity to be at SMU because it was a really good good time to be here there were a lot of changes that happened and sometimes things are starting to do some other things over again that they were doing earlier. Do you get that feeling sometimes? Yes, I do. That they were doing some similar things, but yeah. that sort of happened. It's their time. And I think students who come here are really very fortunate yeah. because I think it's a small enough university that they can have interaction with the professors, with each other, mm -hmm. and also be challenged and exposed to new ideas. I think you're right, and I think they're fortunate because of people like yourself who've been dedicated to teaching and, and, and I greatly appreciate your willingness to share with us this part of your life and your tenure here at SMU and we're glad that you were able to be a part of this event with us as well and hope you've learned some interesting things not only about Dr. Mary Alice Gordon but about SMU from 1968 to 1997. Yes. <laughs>